what Paul Dirac discovered when he was he when he was studying the mystery of the electron holes, the semiconductor holes they're called in the crystal, is that these electrons seem to be coming from the electron hole, the semiconductor hole, and how? But the, the hole is like a little mini black hole in the in the in the surface of the crystal, and nobody could understand them enough to realize that there's a way to to constantly. Uh, open up that vortex and have an infinite amount of electrons coming out of your crystal and you have a permanent crystal power source. Oh, okay. Uh, Boyd Bushman, you know, John Hutchison's friend and mine at Lockheed said they found crystals in the Roswell craft. The power on these crystals is, is in, is in, is at a level of amplitude and voltage we've never seen. When Boyd Bushman told me the numbers, I said, I, I can't, when he first told me, I couldn't believe a crystal could do that, but now I understand why. Somebody figured out how to open up the holes. When we make transformers today out of iron, the first transformers were iron, you know, the square of iron, and you wrap one side and then you wrap the other side and you, you, you do all your math to get your, your farad and your, you know, your whole conversion because you're trying to convert current they have this problem of the electron holes opening up in the iron. And they saw it as a problem because it was disturbing the current. So they made ferrite. They made um, transformers out of materials that had less and less of the holes. Oh, okay. That's what I'm reading in here. <clears throat> and I said, you dummies, you want to open up the holes. You want to open up the holes like crazy. Because that's where all the electrons, the free electrons, are going to come from. If you can really open up those holes. Nobody has done this. It's, when you read this book, you'll see things in here. You'll wonder why the heck these guys weren't thinking of practical applications. Like in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they found molybdenum was the best metal to convert electromagnetism into current. And I thought, why doesn't somebody make a solar panel out of this? Thin film solar is molly steel, molybdenum steel. It took them a hundred years, and they knew a hundred years ago that molybdenum was the best metal to convert photoelectric energy. But they didn't do it a hundred years ago because they weren't thinking. So when you read these books, you find these things that nobody was thinking about practical applications. And the semiconductor hole is the most untapped potential to me in electronics today. And you get better semiconductor holes out of crystal and certain gems than you, you'll ever get out of even iron. And by opening up those holes, that's really where you get zero-point energy. When you open up those holes, you have a permanent power source. But you've got, you got to know about signals because the key to create a vortex, you've got to create a, a, a signal generator. If the numbers are alternating and they're correct, you're creating a hologram of information to tell electrons what to do. So, if the geometry is right in the, in the signature of the hologram of the signals, you should open up a vortex in whatever you apply that field to. And that should make the, the electron holes get bigger. They're like miniature black holes. Now, do, do you think that John Hutchison has crystal power cells? Do you think this might be happening? Oh, yeah. No, his crystal power cells work on a different principle, but there, there are such tiny scale movements in the semiconductors. He puts the he, he bakes a solution of basically crystal trapping little me metallic or conductive flakes in between the crystal. And because the Casimir effect, when you have two plates get really close together, they attract waves that are around us all around us all the time. Oh. And you, you get you get a movement of electrons. But normally those plates try to touch each other and they cancel each other out. He basically bake them so that they don't touch each other and they're a permanent gateway to convert um, um, electromagnetic energy into voltage okay. and current. But, the, but he's not opening up a hole. He's just relying on, the, on a photoelectric effect, which in a way, they're kind of like crystal oscillators. So they're, they're taking kind of ambient field energy and converting... They're taking, converting ambient energy back into current. And they work. And if, but the thing is, the way he did it is he did 
the flakes would, of conductor would line up. Some of them would be like this, and some of them would be like this perfectly with the, with the silica in between them. And they won't touch because the silica stops them from touching, so they remain a permanent power cell. But there's too many that are unaligned. Using nanotechnology, you could make a cell this big where every one of them was perfectly aligned and you have a lot of power. Oh, okay, okay. And John knows that. I've talked to John about that idea, but nobody put the money into it. See, the, the, the place to take an idea like that is Stanford University, where the solid-state industry was, was you know, founded. And you would have permanent little power cells.